conscious knowledge is a spiritual, embodied, uh, holistic type of knowledge. Um, so it's a, it's a way of knowing that interweaves the, the political and the aesthetic, if you like. Um, so by the political, what I mean is analysis, facts, science, uh, topics that are usually given a lot of gravitas in our society. Um, and then the aesthetic are things like arts, the body, the non-human natural world, all kind of like artistic endeavor. So poetry, music, pottery, dance. Um, and so sensuous knowledge is an, is an interweaving of these realms, the political and the aesthetic. Um, you could also say that it is interweaving other worlds that don't typ typically uh, 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 meet, um, partly because of this political and aesthetic divide. So academic uh, analysis with storytelling, science with arts, uh, the, of course, uh, reason with emotion. Um, and so it's really a way of, of, of bringing those uh, worlds into, into conversation with each other. And the reason that that is important is because this is the way that we, we live our lives. Um, you know, so we need a kind of holistic approach to knowledge and to our ways of knowing that correspond with the way that we are human. Um, and uh, I give the example of a, a Yoruba philosophy uh, called Ogbon Inu and Ogbon Ori in my book, Sensuous Knowledge. Um, Ogbon Inu is literally trans translated uh, knowledge of, of the gut and Ogbon Ori is knowledge of the head. So you could say correspondingly emotional intelligence and um, sort of rational thinking. Um, and in Yoruba mythology, uh, this concept Ogbon, which is what translates to knowledge, um, is not seen as complete until or unless Ogbon Inu and Ogbon Uri are interwoven. Um, and so sensuous knowledge is a kind of combination of, of, of these both types of knowledge. Um, I contrast sensuous knowledge to what I refer to as Europatriarchal knowledge. And in contrast to this kind of uh, uh, interweaving approach to knowing, Euro patriarchal knowledge distinguishes and separates and divides between the political and the aesthetic, as I defined them earlier. Um, so it's, a, it's an approach to, to knowing which is um, fragmenting, binary, it has a lot of hierarchies. Um, and these are uh, dividing and separating between the, the body and the mind. So it might be interesting to mention at this point that um, the, 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 the term sensuous, which was coined by John Milton, um, and he coined it because he was looking for a word with which to describe his genre, poetry. Um, and he found that sensual was, uh, you know, was too connected to the kind of the bodily pleasures. Um, and sensuous, in contrast, uh, combines the mind, the body and the spirit. Um, and so, uh, again, sensuous knowledge is really honing in on, the, on those uh, interconnections. Um, and Europatriarchal knowledge, on the other hand, makes these divisions um, not only to sort of, it, it's not for the sake of, of being divisive, it is so that it can kind of control knowledge production. And the more that it can control knowledge production, the more that it can also uh, create a system in which categories of, of humans and of non-humans can also be controlled. There's kind of two aims in sensuous knowledge. So one is to, to, to develop this uh, form of knowledge and a form of an approach to knowledge, which is sensuous and which is holistic and embodied. Um, and the other is to uh, connect that with the kind of black feminist thinking that has been produced over the decades. Um, so black feminism is the only ideology really that has looked at the ways in which different forms of systemic oppression are connected. Um, so it has, 
analyzed how uh, women are oppressed, how people of different class backgrounds and of different racial backgrounds are also victims of, of suppression. And that is because black women historically have tended to embody uh, both class oppression as well as racial and gender oppression. Um, black feminist ideology, and it's important to, to emphasize that um, when I'm speaking about black feminism, I'm not talking about black feminist individuals, but quite uh, sort of the, the, the typical uh, arguments in black feminist thought. Um, and so black feminist thought, aside from looking at race, class and gender, has also had a, a connection to spirit, if you like, and to the arts. Um, so as I described earlier, sensuous knowledge is also uh, uh, being a black feminist theory. It, it kind of combines those worlds. Um, black women have historically around the world been excluded from institutions of power, um, including educational institutions and leadership institutions. And so we have had to look to other sources, to other realms through which we can uh, not only produce knowledge, but produce knowledge that works toward liberation. Black feminist thought has consequently cultivated a type of knowledge production using communication with the natural world, if you like. And, and that in itself has a, it has a poetic and a, a spiritual quality to it as communication and communing with nature typically does. So joy is a, a quality, or maybe I should even say political joy. Um, is something that is, uh, is it's important, not only for black women, I should add, but maybe especially for black women. And in this context, I'm certainly looking at, at us as a group, um, but for everyone. Um, and the reason that, that political joy matters is because joy is a quality that cannot really be suppressed. So when when we feel joy, both individually and collectively, we are far less likely to be suppressed by powerful and tyrannic forces in society. Um, so it's a little bit like if you were to think of an, of an intimate relationship um, in which there is an abuser and the abused, it is much more difficult to abuse somebody who feels a kind of internal um, political conscientious joy, you could say. It is similar when we, when we think about this as a collective. Um, of course, political joy doesn't solve every problem, um, but it is, it is certainly a quality that is really important to cultivate, but also because that is uh, uh, the characteristic, the sentiment that we have been denied for so long in, in oppressive systems. I think that this, this kind of political joy is something that arises um, almost from a combination of, of rage and uh, desire. So there is a, when we feel uh, uh, anger toward the injustices that, that we face in society, um, but we also feel desire for something different. Um, and I think that uh, most people are driven by three desires of sorts. So there's the desire to have meaningful connections with, with others, and I would include uh, non-human others as well in that. Um, there's desire to, to see a better society, to see transformation in society. We, we all kind of feel crippled and impeded by uh, political suffering. Um, and then we feel a desire to to acquire knowledge, um, to, to, to acquire clarity about ourselves and about the societies in which we live. And those desires together, when you merge them, um, they kind of spring us forth toward joy. Um, but they also reveal the places in which uh, there are obstacles for achieving those desires. And so they, they also sort of generate a sense of anger. And political joy is, is almost what comes when you still resolve uh, to try to pursue those things. Um, the type of, and, and this is why uh, sensuous knowledge is relevant because the type of knowledge that, the, or the kind of approach to knowledge in order that you can achieve these three desires um, is one that needs to be malleable and, um, 
and and uh, holistic and and kind of uh, it's it's knowledge it's, it's treating knowledge almost as you would treat a lover. So having having an intimate relationship with knowledge um, rather than one that is rigid and unmalleable. Um, and so you can you can um, you know when you have this type of approach to knowledge, you 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 can do away with things with knowledge that no longer serves its purpose. If you realize that something is no longer producing the outcome um, that that particular type of epistemic tradition was, was intending to do, then you can do away with it. Um, simultaneously, you can, uh, you look for knowledge in sources that you're not encouraged to look for knowledge in. So this is uh, going back to, to finding knowledge in, in rivers or in, in sculptures or in movement and so on. Um, so the first thing I'll say about that is that when I'm speaking about Europatriarchal knowledge, I'm, I'm speaking about a kind of epistemic approach. Um, so it's, it's really, uh, it's centering on narrative and kind of the social imaginary that, that we share, rather than looking at the structure that is Europatriarchy, which also exists. Um, but there, it, it's kind of necessary to separate the two, because when we think about uh, the epistemic production of your patriarchal knowledge, um, what emerges is that it is not all negative in the way that your patriarchal structures are all negative because they are meant to sort of oppress and divide and create hierarchy. But your patriarchal knowledge is responsible, for instance, for modern universities, a lot of modern organizations, um, encyclopedias and things like that. So it, it has uh, produced objects and ways of thinking that are of value to the human species at large. Um, and so when it comes to how we move forward um, and, and you know, integrating sensuous knowledge into a way of moving forward, um, it would mean to, uh, like I spoke about earlier, it's like taking what is useful from different elements in society um, and absolutely then reconfiguring and creating something that is completely different to, to, to the uh, epistemic approaches that we have today. Um, but I would not say that it is just about creating uh, black schools or female schools or anything like that. So the content of education and the approach toward education is far more important than actually the kind of uh, connection to, to identity, to, to race, to gender, to class. Um, that said, of course, uh, there's, there's huge value in, um, and, it, and it is an absolute necessity if we are going to have a, a completely different way of uh, knowing and rebuild society in ways that we can all exist in a, in a higher dimension of sorts. Um, it is essential to talk about uh, race, gender, and class, um, and all other kinds of divisions in society, um, and also uh, things that are emerging as major div divisive factors in society today, such as surveillance, capitalism, and of course, uh, the climate emergency. We need to, to educate children from a very young age about these things and how they are connected to uh, a type of knowledge that has reigned supreme for so long. But that also needs to be, what, what really needs to be cultivated is a, is a different approach to it all. And that needs to be one which, which brings in the, the whole human um, and the whole human's relationship, not only to itself, but to others, as well as to the non-human natural world. So that's really what lies at the center of, of uh, sensuous knowledge. I think the writing is uh, an essential part of, of reconstructing and of uh, reimagining and unlearning um, ways that have been harmful for so long. Um, it, and maybe it's maybe even more than writing, it is um, language, words, meaning um, that, that conveys and, and that helps us as a human species to tell stories about who we are. You see, the issue is that we have it's almost as though the language we have and the writing that we have uh, had that has shaped 
the kind of universal concepts that impact all of our lives for so long um, hasn't been the complete story, uh, therefore rendering it actually incorrect, um, untrue, if you like. Um, so when you have a small group of people, uh, you know, however progressive and, and smart they may be, so, you know, all, all of the kind of key shapers of universal concepts like power and identity and, and the arts and um, beauty and things like that, which are the topics that I address in my book. Um, for, for, for centuries, they've been defined by one small group of people, sometimes expertly, very often with huge flaws and violence. Um, but even worse than the kind of repercussions uh, uh, that, that that type of knowledge production has created in society is that it has actually not aided us collectively as a human species in achieving epistemic truth. Um, it's like looking at a mountain from just one side of the mountain, all you can see is what it looks like from there. Um, and if you then went out and, and you know, wrote, wrote a book about that, you would be given, you would just be given a kind of half truth to people. What happens when we bring in voices and thoughts and practices from groups of people that have seen you know, many different sides of the mountain is that it changes the language, it changes the meaning of what a mountain itself is. Um, and that is the kind of project that, that, that writing um, of a certain kind anyway is, is, is engaged with. Uh, it's certainly what I, what I um, see my writing as doing. Um, so I would say that my writing typically um, arrives at two different kinds of, of places. Um, one in which I am seeking to demystify um, and dismantle knowledge that is untrue, knowledge that is limiting. Um, and on the other hand, I am seeking to, to unearth the truth, almost in the way that an archaeologist would would uh, sort of excavate everything that's in the way of them finding that that thing that they're looking for, and in that process of, of unearthing and excavating, um, the, the 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 parts of the story that are untold um, are in some way they become ethereal because they've been hidden for so long, they've been obscured, and so while it's all very real, there's something about uh, the, the writing that is also magical in some sense, because it is revealing parts of human history that have been hidden, not, not uh, necessarily uh, like alternative parts of human history, but rather hidden parts. So a huge motivation for me writing sensuous knowledge is actually my lived experience. I grew up in Lagos in Nigeria, very cosmopolitan city, also a really uh, patriarchal one and one which is uh, influenced or mired in neo-colonial uh, patterns. Um, as a teenager, I moved to, to Sweden and there I encountered a very racialized reality. Um, uh, I was, you know, I hadn't really been a racialized person before that, um, but I encountered not only that I, I was seen as black, but also that that meant that I would be uh, uh, the recipient of both verbal and physical abuse. Um, and then I, I, I moved to Spain for a while. I lived in New York for some years before moving to London. And um, in all of these, these places, um, I guess I, I always felt like I didn't I didn't fully fit, so um, I, I didn't quite have a home. It was first in, in black feminist thought that I in many ways found a home, um, a, a, an intellectual and a spiritual home of sorts. Of course, I, I bring my own nuance also to, to black feminist thought. And so I had, um, you know, I, I have this background, which is uh, African, Scandinavian. I've lived in, in the US in different parts of Europe. Um, and, and I've always felt that I didn't quite fit in. And what that has meant for me is that I see the world from a kind of multi-perspectival lens. And I have felt frustrated living in societies where 
uh, only one part of myself was ever allowed to exist when I knew that it is possible uh, you know, to, to, to exist as a multi-perspectival human being um, and, and, and that that actually could be really enriching, especially when it came to knowledge production, because whatever issue I was looking at, I was able to look at it from these different prisms. I, I, I speak several languages as well, so I could really, you know, uh, um, unpack an issue. Um, but everywhere I, I went, um, what I encountered was that, you know, we were, we were being told that there is only this one way of looking at something, and that is the right way. I would encourage that people read broadly, of course, you know, read, read literature, fiction and nonfiction and poetry and myths and all of that from, um, from one's local vicinity and, and far and wide across the world. But, but even more than reading, um, you know, as I, as I spoke about in the very beginning, sensuous knowledge is a, is a way of interweaving different worlds together. So it's, it's um, you know, it's by no means saying that uh, emotional intelligence is 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 better than say rational thinking or that that storytelling is better than science or anything like that and so um, a, a, an approach a sensuous approach to knowledge would involve um, whatever topic that you burn for and that you're looking to to understand better or to transform um, to look at it from all of the possible angles that you can so from the political and from the aesthetic, but also, uh, you know, one of the things that I, I do in my book is I um, I have a conversation with Rivers about power, um, and that of course sounds very whimsical, but um, uh, what I, I do kind of try to develop a language through which I can talk to rivers and other elements of nature, and I call that language exusions, um, and you know that's another way of of trying to, to understand um, something like power, which for so long has been defined in very rigid ways as synonymous to coercion, to violence, to dominance. Um, and, and, you know, there's a need to redefine something like power because if we are interested in changing power structures, because patriarchal thought cannot undo patriarchal structures. This is an example um, of how I applied sensuous knowledge to a topic like like power, um, but you could you could think of it um, you could break it down to something as simple as what you had for breakfast in the morning, uh, you know, as a kind of fun thought experiment. If you had a slice of toast with butter, and say you wanted to understand what what is this thing that I ate. Um, you know, you could think about it scientifically. So the, the, the calorific uh, and nutritional <laughs> intake, um, you could also think about it in terms of your senses. You know, how, what, what was the texture of the bread? What did it smell like? What did it taste like? Um, you could think about artists that have painted loaves of bread or something like that. Um, and that really is the, the way that we, you know, if you kind of practice looking at even the, the, the simplest, most mundane things in that way, then it starts to become easier to also look at a, a political movement like feminism in that way, as well as the, the oppositional forces to something like feminism. So in the book, I argue that, um, that beauty cannot exist in an oppressive system, basically. Um, so anything that is beautiful in a system of oppression is beautiful despite rather than because of it. The rapper Tupac Shakur, he, he, in one of his songs, he says, it's, uh, uh, he speaks about a rose growing out of concrete. Um, so beauty in Europe patriarchy is a little bit like Tupac Shakur's rose growing out of concrete. Um, and it's important to preface that when we're speaking about beauty, because um, the way that we typically think about beauty, um, which is, you know, beauty is such an important topic for, for women, particularly. Um, and that, by the way, is because, uh, you know, part of this, this language around beauty has 
for so long been to say that women can be beautiful while men are handsome. And when we think that way, then of course uh, we end up politicizing beauty, but not handsomeness. And that produces a kind of circular logic that we can objectify women, but not men. Um, but what we, uh, what, what is, what your patriarchal knowledge does with a topic like beauty is to, uh, is what it does to everything, every other topic, which is to try and measure and quantify and create hierarchies around beauty. Um, so throughout history, you have theories like the golden ratio, which you know tries to, to, to pinpoint exactly what makes a person beautiful. Um, you have William Hogarth had a theory about what he called the line of beauty. Um, and this all ends up reproducing uh, systems in which beauty is used as one of the foremost tools of oppression against women. And women have to kind of understand how this mechanism works in order to transform it. Um, and so I distinguish between three different types of beauty, which I call political beauty, artificial beauty, and genuine beauty. The point of that is to really ultimately uh, look at beauty from a woman-centered perspective and to reimagine it. Political beauty is very much, it, it's, as it implies, you know, it's beauty that is tied to a political agenda. And that political agenda is one which is heteronormative, ableist, and uh, elitist, and, and of course, patriarchal. Artificial beauty is, is connected with political beauty in that it tries to, it, it is kind of, uh, you know, creating the illusion, the facades of beauty. So it's, a, it's, it's where capitalism comes in um, and, and it solidifies and enforces the political agenda behind political beauty. Whereas genuine beauty is, uh, you know, I, I build that around uh, Toni Morrison's beautiful phrase where she says, we shouldn't only observe beauty, but do beauty. Um, so genuine beauty is a, is a kind of doing beauty. Um, and from that perspective, you know, you can see that beauty, while beauty may not be democratic, you know, every, everybody has different um, tastes. What I find beautiful, you might not find beautiful and so on. Um, but it certainly allows for, for an openness, which includes uh, people of all backgrounds, of all race, sex, class backgrounds, as well as people who are disabled, people who are, um, you know, have different religious backgrounds. It's, it's really creating an open-mindedness and almost, I would say, uh, a, a non-conformity and an anarchism around beauty, because what your patriarchal knowledge um, does, you know, and it's so absurd, is that it, it, it's really looking to, to, to measure and box in something as, as anarchic and non-conformist as beauty. So, so what genuine beauty does is reclaim that sense of, of freedom and play um, and, and, and a kind of agency to, to, to define beauty as one wants and, um, and to be uh, kind of, you know, I always say, be your own beauty icon. Um, there, and, and that applies to all groups and all individuals. So there isn't a, a formula um, for how to do beauty precisely because it is, because I see beauty as something non-conforming. Um, but I will give you a, a, a metaphor of a garden. Um, so if beauty were a garden, then political beauty would be a garden in which everything was really neatly placed and sort of uh, identical looking and there would be the highest point and the lowest point and so on, you get the picture. If artificial beauty were a garden, then it would be a garden into which you stepped and uh, and everything you touched would turn out to be an illusion. So you'd, you'd pluck a beautiful strawberry and it would just not exist in your hand. Um, you'd look into a pond and you wouldn't see your reflection. Uh, so everything would be artificial. If genuine beauty were a garden, it would be one in which um, there's a, where everything is kind of, uh, there's hybridity. Um, things are, 
uh, growing on top of each other or not growing at all. Um, but what would the quality that would emerge would be uh, a sense of something everlasting. Um, so you would be in that garden and you would feel that this is, this is something that has existed from the very beginnings and will always exist. And, and, and you would be able to just kind of be there to find a, a space where you you exist, your presence is there, but the garden's presence is also there. And there's a kind of uh, an ecology of beauty, if you like. Um, and so by sharing this metaphor, uh, you know, I think if we, if we carry that in our spirit, um, when we are looking at how, um, you know, who every year there's an announcement of the most beautiful woman in the world, or, you know, if we look at uh, Instagram influencers or, or objectif objectified women in advertisements, etc., cetera, um, or far more insidiously, uh, you know, the ways in which uh, people are punished for not fitting to, to very strict beauty standards. And of course, also the kind of uh, racism that is uh, embedded into beauty standards if we bear this metaphor of the garden in our minds, um, then hopefully the way that we understand what is happening around us will one, not impact us um, to the point that we, we start to self-harm. Um, at the point at which we start to, to self-harm, and I don't necessarily mean that uh, as, a, as a sort of physical thing that we do, um, but politically self-harm, um, then your patriarchal knowledge has kind of won. Um, and this, you know, goes back to uh, political joy. So with this metaphor of, of the garden, when there's a, 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 an interest in making us uh, to, to feel deprived of beauty, um, then we kind of, that, that's where uh, the sensuous knowledge and the cultivation of, of political joy and this metaphor of the garden uh, can, can help to like recenter and regroup uh, when we speak of a collective. Um, and, and hopefully uh, open up a, a path to doing beauty and not just observing beauty. For more debates, talks and interviews, subscribe today to the Institute of Art and Ideas at IAI-TV.